Hi, my name is Donish Masnamdus. I'm the medical director of Wellward Regenerative Medicine, uh, a clinic in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, this is the second lecture in a series on opioids, uh, which I've tried to develop as a non-industry biased uh, didactic. If uh, there are any clinicians watching this and would like to get uh, continuing medical education credit for this, please follow the links below. Otherwise, we are going to talk about pain mismanagement, uh, or rather how the non-evidence-based standards of care and pain management developed. Whenever we talk about pain management, the first thing most people think about is the pain medications. And we've seen the problems that have evolved from over-reliance on opioids. And the conversation has now shifted towards what do we do about this problem? But the problem really can't be addressed without the proper framing. And really the, the, uh, the focus of the conversation has been framed for us in a way that really uh, obscures the problems. Namely, the conversation has been focused on safety. How do we prescribe opioids safely so that the population that is receiving them is we're minimizing the risks. But this basic question bypasses a more fundamental question of whether it's even worth having the safety conversation. Are they even effective and warrant reliance, uh, in which case safety is a concern. But if it's not effective, then what's the value of talk? There's a lot of industries that are supporting the perspective of how do we do this in a more safe manner but there is a bias to what they do uh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that has had uh, exponential growth in the past in the early 90s uh, it was a fairly low uh, source of income for most pharmaceuticals. It was in the order of tens of millions of dollars annually. But over the course of uh, several years, the income became uh, over $10 billion per year um, for uh, opioids alone. And throughout this time frame, there were reports and indications like the GA report of 2004 that gave some suggestion that opioids may not be the best solution for pain because of the complications. Uh, and yet, in spite of this, the pharmaceutical industry was able to forge forward and still uh, grow rapidly. There's a, um, a number of suits that have taken place across the country. Uh, there's a lot of really good information uh, online on um, the, the strategies and methodologies pharmaceutical use to convey um, an altered notion of how to prescribe, uh, how to manage pain. Um, particularly the, the LA County suit is posted online with uh, a lot of really good information that is has been legally vetted. Most of it comes down to the way the pharmaceutical industry educated not only clinicians, but also the, the non-healthcare population around both pain management and the management of opioids, conveying this perspective that uh, pain is a problem, that the solution is simple, and the solution is opioids. Therefore, simply increasing use of opioids will fix the problem of pain. Very systematic plan that uh, used strategies from a variety of uh, industries that don't have a great positive image but yet have been able to become very successful in in uh, their field and it goes through four phases um, phase the, the first component was hallmark studies that were misrepresented in the medical literature uh, these studies typically downplayed the harms of opioids and and um, bolstered the benefits, uh, some of which without substantiation. Uh, they recruited key opinion leaders or physicians that were trusted in the medical community to provide public uh, expert opinion on 
uh, both opioids and managing pain in, uh, in uh, this perspective. Um, they, they leveraged advocacy groups, which mostly consisted of very vulnerable populations looking for treatment uh, and uh, giving them a voice. But this voice was often in a direction that was to their detriment and uh, in many cases generated a greater sense of disenfranchisement. And finally, they used various strategies to stigmatize uh, not only the clinicians who were providing a rational opinion uh, uh, around opioids and, and portray them as heartless or cruel uh, clinicians, but also they were stigmatizing the people with addiction as um, the reason that uh, there was so much scrutiny over opioids and that these extreme cases uh, were, were so aberrant that, uh, that most people wouldn't qualify for these criteria, uh, completely over, overshadowing the um, behavioral problems that, that implicitly do develop with opioid dependency. So we're going to go through each of these strategies one by one and demonstrate what uh, exactly the pharmaceutical uh, marketing did. A lot of this began in the uh, mid to late 80s where conversation around pain management became more prominent because in truth there was a time where even palliative care patients were, uh, were not really adequately having their pain treated. Uh, and so what began in that palliative environment grew um, with a number of articles that uh, that relayed the safety of opioids, particularly uh, 1980 article by Porter and Jick and a 1986 article by Portnoy and Foley. These articles became among the most heavily cited articles in all of medical literature. Uh, these numbers have grown since this uh, presentation was prepared, uh, but there are over 900 article citations for Porter and Jick. So I think it's worthwhile to go into great depth and detail dissecting apart this this article as to why uh, it became so heavy. And this is essentially the entirety of that article. It's one paragraph in the New England Journal of Medicine that wasn't really even an article but rather uh, an op-ed. Uh, even uh, after these these articles became so prevalent in the literature, Porter and Chick, uh, the um, scientists who were, were uh, behind the study came out and said that really it wasn't their intent to um, to extrapolate the conclusions that were extrapolated from this article. And essentially it was a retrospective uh, review of uh, 40,000 patients, uh, 11,000 of whom received an opioid while they were in-house. And subsequently only four of them had well-documented addiction, um, whereas they had previously no history of addiction. And so from this, they concluded that despite the widespread use of opioids in hospitals, that addiction is rare. Um, and this became the, the um, flag for opioids being safe uh, and non-addictive. 
many of the studies that were quoted uh, were misrepresent gross misrepresentations of the study themselves, just like this was. Uh, the perspective was that opioids are not addicted if taken uh, as directed. This essentially shifts the onus of responsibility to physicians to protect and identify uh, patients with risks of addiction. Uh, whereas in reality, 15 to 40 percent of patients receiving an opioid uh, are, uh, do eventually become addicted. Um, in the time frame that opioids were being um, more relied upon, we saw nearly tenfold increase in the number of addiction admissions to hospital programs. And there was a 350% increase in uh, opioid use during the time, this same time frame. All along, medications that were non-addictive and effective as analgesics were being downplayed and uh, and portrayed as more harmful. So in the decade of 2000 to 2010, there is a, a pretty steady increase in opioid usage. However, uh, there is a steady decrease in uh, anti-inflammatories and acetaminophen. And just to give perspective on this, the uh, uh, number of people who die each year from uh, all forms of overdose is somewhere uh, above 50,000. But the number of people who die from liver-related complications as a result of overuse of Tylenol or overdose of Tylenol, somewhere in the order of 400 uh, across the entire country. Um, with that kind of a, a two order of magnitude spread, uh, it just seems silly to, to be harping on uh, the risks of anti-inflammatories and acetaminophen in comparison to opioids. Many of these studies downplayed the harms uh, by denying the addictive potential of opioids and claiming that judicious use of, uh, uh, of opioids um, warranted risk, um, risk mitigation and, and identification of risk factors. Um, it coined, they coined uh, fictitious uh, terms like pseudo-addiction, which, uh, which rationalized uh, opioid, opioid use disorder behavior as uh, just an indication of undertreatment of pain. Um, and they shifted the focus away from serious complications like physical dependency or opioid use uh, disorder uh, or even opioid induced hyperalgesia by um, shifting to things that generally uh, go away or are controlled like nausea, vomiting or uh, uh, pruritus. And the benefits were portrayed as being much more efficacious uh, than they, they actually were. Um, they utilized a concept called enriched enrollment, which we'll cover in a little bit, uh, that in essence uh, screened out patients who were intolerant of opioids uh, so that uh, FDA received studies that were primarily um, on patients who were tolerant of opioid uh, side effects. Uh, and again, they minimized competing, anti, uh, competing categories of, of treatment, such as analgesics, but not only analgesics, uh, they also conveyed risks of other modalities uh, and really in some cases ignored effective modalities uh, such as physical therapy. Um, most of the studies were of short duration. Uh, there was no study during this time frame that looked at opioids beyond 16 weeks and in fact most of them were even less than six weeks. Um, Whereas uh, even the FDA noted that improvements in function, uh, social function, ability to perform daily activities have never been demonstrated, uh, the FDA continued to approve more and more opioids during the same time. The um, various uh, support groups for opioids put out policymaker guidelines and clinician guidelines, which often uh, overrepresented what opioids do. Uh, for instance, the American Pain Foundation's Policymakers Guide uh, indicated that opioids help alleviate pain, restore function, and improve the quality of life. Whereas most of the studies that they used to quote to, to extrapolate these conclusions uh, 
were inaccurate. So, uh, for instance, in headaches, uh, the studies they used were uh, showing higher rates of headaches, higher scores on MIDAS, which is a, a um, uh, gauge for uh, headache frequency and intensity. Uh, sleep dysfunction, increased confusion, increase in rebound headaches, decrease in quality of life were all shown by the same studies that were used to uh, rationalize opioids as alleviating pain. Same with low back pain, that most of the studies showed no improvement in function, and yet, uh, and yet the more prominent lines or statements within the policymaker guide was that there is a restoration of function. Uh, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, um, the policymakers' guide was was placed under greater scrutiny, and and showed that uh, the conclusions were that uh, in the policymaker guides were were that multiple clinical studies showed improvement in daily function, psychological health, and health-related quality of life indicators. Where in reality, those same studies were or were showing that functional outcomes with other analgesics were on par with opioids and that studies were of short duration uh, lasting only if uh, only five weeks but purported as long term in the American Family Physician um, Jensen had an ad in 2010 that uh, that purported that opioids were, opioid ef efficacy uh, meets unexpected tolerability suggesting that uh, the side effects of opioids were really marginal compared to the effectiveness. But the article that was cited by this advertisement was only conducted over five days. And in an acute setting, you could make an argument that uh, most people would show some functional improvement uh, with opioid use, but it does not translate into long-term efficacy. Cochrane looked at um, studies used for FDA clearance and found that 22% this uh, of patients in opioid trials for FDA clearance of a new drug had dropped out because of intolerable side effects like nausea, dizziness, delirium. Um, and so this became such a problem that the FDA created an exclusion for opioid manufacturers called enriched enrollment in which they allowed the research being presented for FDA clearance to exclude patient data uh, from the clinical trial that uh, showed adverse effects. So essentially, the study population would go through one screening where they would rule out all the patients who had adverse effects from opioids and then look strictly at the patients who did not have adverse effects uh, to justify whether this medication should be FDA cleared or not. And this became a real controversy that came out, but really nothing was done as a result of this. Um, there's a lot of intentional deception uh, for marketing uh, purposes. Um, OxyContin, for instance, is, is uh, FDA cleared as a 12-hour drug. And at the time, there were no other medications that would have this, this duration of action. Uh, make giving OxyContin uh, a tremendous marketing advantage over other opioids. Uh, however, um, it was later found that even within the company, within Purdue, uh, it was well established that um, the medication would not last more than eight hours. Uh, and um, this created a lot of problems. When doctors complained that OxyContin doesn't last 12 hours, the manufacturer Purdue Pharma tells them to prescribe stronger doses, not more frequent ones. Raising the strength results in higher highs and lower lows, experts say. This may extend the drug's duration, but it doesn't guarantee 12 hours of relief. So as a result, uh, it was unclear whether patients who were complaining about inadequate pain control with OxyContin were dealing with uh, true breakthrough pain, like their, the organic etiology of pain was showing spikes throughout the day, or if it was truly that the patient was actually feeling a rebound pain, um, because most of these medications were fairly high, high potency. I mean, at some point, Purdue 
was putting out a, an OxyContin pill that was 160 milligrams of, of uh, OxyContin. And um, if you have a dip in the levels of, of medication when you're at that high of a dosage, you're indeed going to have breakthrough pain. Um, but rather than, folk, rather than coming to terms with this and acknowledging it, um, the pharmaceutical reps would often report that uh, this reinforces the necessity of these medications and that rather than, um, rather than doing an opioid rotation, we should add a breakthrough agent to, um, to cover those, those breakthrough periods rather than those withdrawal pains. Uh, and as a result, it increased the doses, which also increased the profits for Purdue. Um, in 2001 sales data, uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical charged wholesalers average $97 for, for a 10 milligram pill, uh, which is their smallest dosage of uh, OxyContin. But the maximum strength at that time, the 80 milligram pill, ran for more than $630. So reps were encouraged to nudge physicians towards higher dosage prescribing um, because it, it added um, to their bonus as well as and they profited pretty well. Um, so OxyContin uh, or Purdue Pharmaceuticals in 1996 had very minuscule uh, revenue from uh, the opioid industry but they rapidly saw this grow and even after uh, the GAO report came out that indicated some concern over uh, OxyContin and, and long-acting opioids. They were able to recover from that and go into record growth uh, within a couple of years. Um, Purdue's uh, executives were often uh, noted to say they didn't want to niche OxyContin as an oncology medication, which was uh, initially its intent. Uh, that rather they wanted this to be a more mainstream medication. And they were successful in doing so. By 2010, 20% of doctor's visits uh, for pain issues resulted in an opioid prescription, making uh, OxyContin a $30 plus billion dollar drug. Even uh, to this day, it's still producing uh, above $10 billion dollars. They did so. They did. They were successful in doing this by um, by putting out a lot of marketing around OxyContin. They put more money in their uh, their marketing budget than any other company did, and they they pioneered some of the strategies that are now prevalent among pharmaceutical uh, representatives in um, how they educate clinicians and and um, uh, encourage use of their uh, this was a new wave of marketing, particularly in Southeast Kentucky, where access to specialty care was limited and um, primary care was really uh, the robust uh, provider for all medical needs. Uh, in particularly in Cole County, this was a problem with uh, um, average OxyContin prescriptions uh, ranking as some of the highest uh, uh, prescribing counties in the country. Uh, for instance, uh, Cumberland, Perry, and Harlan County were, were somewhere around 20,000 grams of OxyContin per 100,000 population. Uh, just to give you perspective on how astronomically out of bounds this was, the U.S. average at that time was 3,000 uh, grams per 100,000. Uh, nearly sevenfold increase over the national average. The reps in this area saw OxyContin prescriptions grow uh, tenfold over a five year span. And by 2003, half of the physicians that were prescribing OxyContin were not specialists or oncologists, they were primary care physicians, which was exactly what Purdue's goal was. Um, their reps were heavily compensated for this. Uh, even at that time, the, the rep salaries were among the highest in the industry. However, their bonuses were uh, just unheard of in any other field. 
uh, ranking up as high as $240,000 per year in some of the um, rural counties in Kentucky. So in addition to the Hallmark studies that, um, that they put out there, uh, they recruited key opinion leaders who were trusted medical experts uh, to, to give a greater sense of safety. And key opinion leaders are, are physicians or clinicians that are well uh, known in the lay population. They're trusted by the media, the community, uh, and even in science. Um, some may or may not have lost their reputation, but nonetheless, at, at the time that uh, uh, they, these key opinion leaders are used, they are deemed as reputable sources of information. Uh, and they're used to influence policy, continue medical education curricula, um, uh, organizational meetings, and uh, treatment guidelines. These key opinion leaders were, were instilled with the responsibility of, of providing a false sense of security to opioid prescribing. Uh, there's this presumption of efficacy that, that I mentioned earlier, which, uh, which then um, goes straight towards how do we do, how do we safely prescribe opioids uh, if they are presumed to be effective. The perspective of, uh, pushed in these, uh, in these educational uh, programs where that was that addiction is not realistically uh, happening if pain is being, if medications are being used for treating pain. And that even for patients that are vulnerable to addiction, that it's feasible to mitigate the risks by using screening questionnaires, urine testing, and pill counts. Um, it also conveyed a, a notion that long-acting opioids are safer. At the time, uh, by this point, most opioids on the market were generic. And so in order to um, have a patent and, and branding rights to a medication, they had to have some other alteration to that medication, particularly creating long-acting um, opioids, which were deemed as being safer. Uh, not really an accurate state. Um, a lot of this began with, uh, with regulatory bodies like uh, the Joint Commission, uh, where in 2000, uh, June Dahl, who was a pharmacologist, um, uh, was one of the proponents of making pain the fifth vital sign. Uh, there were many other key opinion leaders on the committee who uh, reinforced this perspective and, and eventually made pain, uh, which is a subjective perception, into a vital sign, vital signs being objective measures of, of uh, acute health. Um, and other agencies jumped on this bandwagon. Um, they, there was a lot of CMEs and didactics around the fifth vital sign of pain, uh, influencing even CMS to, um, to have a punitive effect on uh, institutions that were not reflectively uh, addressing pain accurately or adequately. Um, one of the key opinion leaders who uh, who put a lot of uh, inf this information in the hands of, of policymakers and decision makers uh, was uh, Dr. Fishman, who wrote a book on responsible opioid prescribing. Uh, in this book, uh, uh, so first of all, the book was sponsored by uh, pharmaceutical industry, and and they were the ones that funded the printing and distribution to uh, this wide population. In the book, uh, it um, suggests that opioids are safe and effective for chronic non-cancer related pain or non-malignant pains. Uh, that under that opioids were currently under prescribed for these conditions. The, the uh, dr risk of addiction is low unless the patient has additional risk factors for addiction and that medical boards should consider the under-treatment of pain as a punitive issue uh, because it's a departure from acceptable standards of practice. If a physician should under-treat pain, then they should be sanctioned and should be disciplined for insufficient uh, coverage. And bear in mind, this went out to 21 
uh, state medical boards. The book also coined the term pseudo-addiction to explain abnormal behaviors around opioids uh, and to give a false sense of security that uh, people showing signs of opioid use disorder uh, were not uh, were actually undertreated patients. Uh, another clinician, Portnoy, who was uh, the author of that second paper I showed at the beginning, um, be that became one of the most highly cited pain papers. Uh, in 2010, he was interviewed on Good Morning America, uh, stating that addiction, when treated when treating pain, is uncommon and that clinicians ought to feel assured that unless the patient has risk factors, they are not going to become addicted. That's when a handful of doctors, led by New York pain specialist Russell Portnoy, began spreading the message that people suffering from chronic pain should also get access to the drugs. There was a sense among those of us who wanted these drugs to be used more for patients with chronic pain that we had to destigmatize these drugs. We had to bring them from the cold into mainstream medical practice. We had to have doctors thinking in terms of risk and benefit instead of thinking in terms of these consequences that are so scary like addiction and, and death. Portner co-wrote this seminal paper in 1986. It argued that opioids could be used in a much larger group of people without cancer including patients suffering from more common complaints such as back pain or nerve pain. In speeches around the country, Dr. Portnoy and others argued that fears of prescribing opioids were overblown. Their efforts were successful beyond what they could have imagined. Today, those drugs are among the most widely prescribed in America. Now Portnoy and many of his followers are having second thoughts. They say they overstated the benefits of the drugs and understated the risks. Do you think that some of your early advice represented misinformation? If you said, did I teach about pain management and specifically about opioid therapy in a way that reflects misinformation? Well, against the standards of 2012, I guess I did because we didn't know then what we know now. Um, so I guess I did. More than 16,500 people die in the U.S. from opioid overdoses each year. According to government studies, millions more are abusing or are addicted to the drugs. Next, what you should know about pain medicines. In the 1990s, Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, amplified the pro-opioid message with promotional videos like this one, featuring Portnoy and other doctors. The likelihood that the treatment of pain using an opioid drug, which is prescribed by a doctor, will lead to addiction is extremely low. In the videos and elsewhere, they said that less than 1% of patients became addicted and that overdoses were extremely rare. Produce as the videos reflected expert opinion at the time. Another uh, physician, David Haddox, uh, wrote a book called The Pain Clinic Manual. He later became the chief medical officer of Purdue and currently practices, uh, currently is the chief medical officer. Um, in uh, The New Yorker, he was quoted uh, saying, a lot of these people say, well, I was taking the medication like my doctor told me to, and then they start taking them more and more and more. Uh, he told a reporter in 2001, I don't see where that's my problem. Um, and I, I think that's, a, that's kind of a negligent way of practicing. Lynn Webster is a, is a pain clinician who's an advocate on uh, opioid prescribing. Um, he stated, uh, if I don't treat them, Will they commit suicide? If I do treat them, will they be harmed? It's damn difficult. I don't know any field in medicine that is more challenging. And I, I agree, there's a lot of challenges with pain, within pain management. Um, nevertheless, there are ways to, to uh, mitigate those risks and manage their pain. Dr. Webster argues that uh, uh, use of opioid risk tools are effective in in managing some of these risks, and he continues to advocate for liberal opioid prescribing. Uh, but the risk tools are, are uh, only as effective as the honesty of the patients taking it. And most patients who have uh, uh, an opioid use disorder are also intelligent enough to figure out what questions need to be answered how in order to not be, not be flagged by uh, opioid risk assessment tools nor have any of these tools been validated to be effective uh, in any clinical study. Um, in 2010, DA investigated um, 20 overdoses in his clinic. He was uh, later cleared of charges, but uh, to me that's problematic to have that many um, overdose patients. 
So this is the opioid risk tool um, that he developed. Uh, in it, these are our risk factors that do indicate um, risks for addiction, such as a family history of abuse, uh, of course, a personal history of substance abuse, uh, young age, um, uh, early uh, adolescent sexual abuse, or any other psychological disorder. Uh, however, again, this is only as effective as uh, the honesty of the people taking it. If a person with pain goes in and says, I've tried hydrocodone and I've tried Aleve, and Aleve makes my stomach really upset, but hydrocodone works great, they're immediately accused of being a drug seeker. Oh my God, they know the name of the medication. They want a particular medication. And there's such a stigma out there about narcotics. You get outrage. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of amazing. It, it's shocking. In America, how can it be so bad for the voiceless who suffer in pain? I try not to look in the mirror because of the person I don't recognize anymore. These are some of the people you will meet in this report and observe what they go through. You will see what we saw over two years, crisscrossing America, documenting those chronic pain sufferers who live in the shadows. It's hard to keep up friendships when you're sitting in your house curled up in a ball. Misunderstood. Just look in my eyes and know that the pain is real. Shunned by the stigma of often being on opioids. We are not drug addicts. We are not drug addicts. All we are seeking is relief from pain. Being told it's in his or her head. It's not in my head. Being denied insurance. I can't for the life of me understand why insurance companies have that kind of power over people. We found the stories from Carolyn, Grady, Marty, and Crystal repeated in state after state. Just because it's not visible does not mean you're not in pain. All victims of a broken medical system that failed them, or sometimes even addicted them, one as an NFL star. And I can see people looking at me and pointing, oh, there's that football player that went to prison. Oh, there's that football player that got hooked onto drugs. We also found dozens of doctors and other providers who courageously spoke out against the way we treat those in pain. To refer to it as an abomination is, is probably uh, too kind. And experts who say it's the economics of insurance that makes ours the worst pain management system in the Western world. Give them a pill and send them home. And what has to change? These are the topics we will cover in this report. Because the odds are about one in three that you are next. Nearly a third of all Americans will suffer from chronic pain. I consider it a moral outrage. I think that our system is pitiful. I think pain medicine is a business. It's not a profession. I think that for the most part, the medical industrial complex really cares very little about the patient and a patient suffering. So this uh, documentary was produced by Dr. Webster and he actually he even wrote a book about uh, called The Painful Truth as well, um, which which really underscores a lot of the uh, the hopelessness uh, conveyed to patients that uh, there's a need for the, the medications that they're dependent on without which they really can't live functional, sustainable lives. Um, I agree, the medical infrastructure is not working for most pain patients. Too kind.
Um, so it's the sense of iatrogenic hopelessness um, that's conveyed within the chronic pain population by clinicians like uh, what Dr. Webster's messages are, um, that they're only, uh, that in order to be adequately treated for pain, um, there is a certain hopelessness in it that uh, you're dependent on the medication for function. And so this is where uh, a lot of the information meets the population um, by developing advocacy, group, advocacy groups who uh, are essentially very vulnerable populations that do need help uh, and do need medical assistance, but, uh, but chasing them with opioids is not a surrogate for the help that they need to actually become functional, physically able-bodied individuals. There are many advocacy groups that developed uh, over the years. Uh, most of them focused on the physically and psychologically vulnerable populations who do have pain, people who have had a disruption in their pain be in their life because of pain issues. Uh, these people tend to be desperate for a solution. Um, they were given a language and a, a sense of, of being broken beyond repair and being disenfranchised by the medical community. Um, that uh, enabled a progressive decline uh, and provoke, promoted an illusion of improved quality of life with the use of opioids. Um, the solutions that they were given were oversimplified solutions uh, that a pill can actually fix the problem, whereas there's no opioid in the world that's going to, uh, say, fix a broken leg. <coughs> it's proper medical treatment that does that. Um, and they marginalized proper medical treatment by focusing on safe prescribing and symptom mitigation without ever really understanding or dissecting apart well, what is it that's causing this person's pain. And there are some people that have unrelenting pain that really does not have a good option. Um, but uh, uh, in a later lecture, I'll explain why opioids are a limited tool, not, not an it's not an abstinent tool. It's it's there is some utility to it, but not in the way that's currently being. Uh, Opana ER, for instance, uh, their their uh, slogan on this ad was "Complex Challenges, One Solution," completely throwing under the bus all the other uh, other modalities that that really need to be leveraged in patients who have chronic. These. Uh, Advocacy groups took many different forms, such as professional organizations that uh, represented clinicians. Um, they were patient advocacy groups uh, that, uh, uh, that used patient accounts and um, provided the language to patients to advocate uh, on their behalf. But uh, many of these were propped up by uh, the pharmaceutical industry uh, for instance, the American Pain Foundation uh, shut down in 2012 um, after it, it became public knowledge that 95% plus of their uh, revenue was pharmaceutical support. Um, it even went into various agencies like the Federation of State Medical Boards, uh, the Joint Commission, even the FDA was influenced by, um, by a lot of pharmaceutical uh, um, uh, motives. Uh, there was a, a collaborative for risk mitigation strategies uh, that was intended to educate the community and medical community around safe opioid prescribing. But the sponsors of these, uh, uh, of most of these were um, were pharmaceutical driven and the, the uh, m subtle message in it was that long-acting opioids, which are typically branded medications, um, were safer and more effective. Um, which led, led to a number of safety organizations being developed, many of whom were, um, were essentially fronts for various pharmaceutical uh, Companies, uh, they were shells to promote a financial agenda by conveying this notion that uh, they're looking out for the safety of the population through 
uh, opioid risk mitigation. Um, it provided a lot of, uh, of messaging that reinforced uh, themselves and became a self-validating tool to, uh, to uh, instill beliefs in the, in the community that were not based on science. Um, there's a group called the American Society of Pain Educators, for instance, and I'm going to switch screens uh, so that um, you can see their message. The population that were targeted in many of these uh, these advocacy campaigns were people that had insurance but were uh, vulnerable as well, such as the elderly. Um, in uh, uh, in 2009, the uh, American Geriatric Society put out um, a perspective on managing pain in the elderly, uh, but it was later identified that over 50% of the experts on the panel that made the recommendations were um, had financial ties to opioid companies. So the bias of this uh, of these recommendations were, of course, very opioid uh, friendly. Another population that was uh, leveraged were the were veterans. Uh, the American Veterans and Service Member Survival Guide uh, is is a pretty good guide for servicemen coming out of service and trying to navigate back into a uh, normal way of life. But the section on pain was uh, was written by. Um, there were a number of different uh, advocacy groups that put out uh, informational videos like um, this one, uh, which was uh, a coalition of a variety of pharmaceuticals who had uh, opioid interests. Welcome to Let's Talk Pain. I'm Carol Martin. On Let's Talk Pain, we're going to be speaking with people who live with pain and those who treat pain as well. I'm joined today by Dr. Eugene Viscusi and also by Kathy Church. Now, with their help, we hope to better understand how pain affects people's lives, also to learn about some of the tools and tactics that can help you best manage pain. Let's Talk Pain is not only the name of our program, but it's first and foremost a coalition whose mission is to increase awareness of pain and improve how it's treated. Through Let's Talk Pain, we want to encourage people who have to live with pain and their healthcare professionals to talk about the issues at hand, also to listen actively to one another, and then take action to improve care for those living with pain. Hopefully, we can open a conversation around this very sensitive topic. Now, chronic pain, of course, can be overwhelming. Treatments differ from patient to patient, and there are often side effects that can add to the challenge of pain management. In this episode, we're going to talk about tackling some of those challenges. Kathy Church, we're glad you're with us today. Let me tell you Kathy's story. She's a social worker and a 2008 recipient of the National Pain Foundation's Triumph Award. Her story is really amazing. About uh, 15 years ago, while on active duty in the Army, she suffered a surgical error that led to chronic pain mm -hmm. and 13 follow-up surgeries. She then took a medical discharge from the Army, but there was really no relief from her pain. Kathy focused on her education, ultimately earning her master's degree in social work. She now works to improve care for those who must endure chronic pain while fighting her own battles as well. She's testified at the federal level about the needs of pain patients and also the need for better education about pain care for physicians. I encourage everybody to go to letstalkpain.org and watch Kathy's in-depth profile to really learn more about her triumphs through this adversity. And of course, it's really good to have you with us, Kathy. I also want you to meet Dr. Jean Viscusi, who is the Director of Acute Pain Management and Regional Anesthesia also an associate professor of anesthesiology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Dr. Viscusi also lectures internationally. He has authored more than 100 book chapters and 50-plus peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals, so he knows that about which he speaks. We're glad to have you with us as well, Dr. Viscusi. 
Um, let's get started talking about these challenges, and there are so many. I'll ask the first question of you, Doctor. How does someone start on a path toward understanding where to start? Well, I think the first challenge is finding the resources that are available. And for many patients, pain, both acute and chronic, is overwhelming. And navigating through the healthcare system and finding uh, providers who are sensitive to pain issues can be a, a real challenge. And you make the point that pain is real, so the stigma about whether you're actually feeling it. Well, I think the, the particular challenge is that there is a view that pain is, is entirely subjective and that it is a, a personal experience and that uh, therefore there may be less credibility to some complaints of pain or less believability and that uh, there truly are validated ways to measure pain. Uh, it's not just purely a subjective experience. We have tools or instruments mm -hmm. that are very reliable and, and reproducible uh, that can be used to evaluate a patient's pain experience. And to that point, Kathy, I know you can speak. You have to be vigilant about trying to find your way out, yes? Yes, it's, it's very difficult. You can get caught in almost a quagmire in the healthcare system, you have to be able to advocate for yourself. You have to be able to educate yourself as much as you can on treatments available, but also be open to hearing what your doctor has to say. I think physicians want to treat a patient who is actively involved in their treatment, but not close-minded about their treatment. So it's a fine line between knowing what you want and, and working with your physician um, together to come up with the best treatment. But also at the same time, if your physician isn't listening to you or you don't feel listened to, to say, hey, I, I'm still in pain, this isn't working for me, can we please try something else? And so. your story, as we said, 13 surgeries, again, at letstalkpain.org, we can hear more of your story. So you're not able to um, find this anymore um, uh, on, on, you can't find Let's Talk Pain on the internet anymore. But the other episodes that were, uh, were uh, conducted talked about strategies for communicating with health care professionals, depression, anxiety, and relational issues, the impact on life, work, sleep, exercise, social activities. And while maybe the intent of these these didactics were uh, noble. The effect was that, for the most part, it it gave patients an a sense of empowerment to advocate for themselves and what felt good uh, and what fe feels good in the short run is opioids. But um, it it <clears throat> it bypasses a lot of the problems. Um, advocacy groups like the National In Initiative on Pain Control. Uh, developed a lot of the statements that many patients used almost verbatim. Um, <clears throat> like, for instance, the level of pain should Im function Im should improve. You may find that, that opioids allow the patients to participate in activities of daily living, such as work, hobbies, uh, that you weren't able to enjoy previously. And um, while the occasional use of an opioid for functional activity may be justified, the, the conversation around what effect that's having on the body is never, never in any of these, um, uh, of these programs. If, for instance, you have a sprained ankle and you take pain medication in order to go on a hike, you're, you're essentially breaking that ankle down further and further. Uh, and so the, the notion that opioids should be used for functional improvement has some flaws in it that are never really uh, disclosed to the patient but rather they are encouraged to advocate for themselves to, um, to essentially usurp medical opinion. The American Academy of Pain Medicine was another uh, professional organization uh, who strongly advocated for more liberal utilization of opioids, but this is another organization that had a lot of influence from pharmaceutical from the pharmaceutical industry. For instance, they had a corporate membership uh, that was $25,000, and with this corporate membership, uh, you would have, you would be able to have influence over the, the didactics at the annual meeting and provide dinner symposia uh, to provide further education. Um, 
the cons there was a consensus statement uh, written in 1997 of which Dr. Haddix, the the subsequent CMO for Purdue Pharmaceutical, was a major player, um, and he was actually the VP of Health Policy in the year 2000 uh, for AAPM. Um, the statement itself was revised in 2009, but 14 of the 21 panel members were paid consultants of uh, some pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and then ultimately the statement was removed in 2011. And what made this statement so problematic are a number of facts. So the statement itself became um, a foundation for a lot of other uh, articles. And as of uh, April 2017, it was cited 15, over 1,500 times by various articles. Um, the intent of the, the guideline was well-intentioned. However, uh, there were a lot of problematic statements made within this, and these are just a few. I have a, a supplemental case review which goes through the, uh, these guidelines in more detail and, and uh, points out some of the uh, flawed statements and conclusions. So first of all, it endorses that opioids are a first-line therapy for moderate to severe pain. Um, that even in the case of addiction, opioids are reasonable to be used as a frontline agent, uh, taking into consideration risk mitigation strategies. And um, many addictionologists would argue that, that opioids ought not to be the first-line therapy for somebody with a history of addiction. It argued for high-dose opioids, um, and it normalized doses even above 200 milligrams of morphine equivalents as, uh, as normal, appropriate levels of medication. Um, whereas even by this point in history, there was uh, ample evidence that above uh, 90 milligrams of morphine equivalents dramatically increases the risk of complications. Uh, and finally, it, it recommended obtaining, obtaining a consult with a pain specialist as a second-line therapy, uh, arguing that the um, primary care clinician is well-suited and, and knowledgeable enough to manage opioids and manage chronic pain um, without the need for consultation for cost containment reasons. Many of these industry-supported guidelines went in direct opposition to non-industry-supported guidelines. For instance, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians in 2012 had a guideline that uh, stated the following. The recent revelation that the pharmaceutical industry was involved in the development of opioid guidelines may in fact be facilitating the opioid problem. Uh, thus, therapeutic opioid use, specifically in high doses, not only lacks scientific evidence but is, in, but is in fact associated with serious health risks, including fatalities, uh, emotional, uh, and is based on emotional and pro political propaganda under the guise of improving treat, uh, pain treatment. Um, another organization, the American College of uh, Occupational and Environmental Medicine, had guidelines published in 2014, which uh, stated that there is no evidence of superior of, of opioids being superior in analgesia than other uh, non-opioid analgesics that lower doses of opioids demonstrate better outcomes even in acute pain situations and that less than 50 milligram morphine equivalent daily dosage ought to be uh, uh, more typical doses uh, than what was being being uh, prescribed as a norm. So beyond the uh, advocacy, uh, advocacy groups and their influences, the, the final leg of the strategic plan was to stigmatize and divert attention, uh, essentially portraying clinicians as uh, being um, uncaring or inhumane in treating pain if they weren't heavily relying on opioids. And that the patient of the patients who uh, 